Walsh is the CEO of Alpha Cubed Investments. He just wrote a book called Exponential Gains, which looks at how to find and manage the next great stocks to transform your portfolio. So welcome, Todd. So Thank excited you, to hear Thanks about this. Thanks for having me here. So excited. Because I've been working as a business reporter for years and I still can't figure all this out. So. <laughs> Let's start with, with you. Just give me, uh, what is Alpha Cubed? How did you get started in this business? So I'm the CEO of Alpha Cubed Investments. We're a registered investment advisory firm with about over $2 billion, clients all across the country. And these are what we call uh, high net worth retail investors, people with 500,000 up to 20 or 30 million who just don't want to have to go back to work or can develop a good retirement plan so they don't have to work the rest of their lives. They want to be able to count on their money to grow and be there when they need it. Okay. Sounds like what everybody's dream is. Yes. <laughs> and you just wrote this book, Exponential yes. Games. What inspired you to write the book? So I've been doing this since 1986. I've been a financial advisor since 1986, believe it or not. I don't even know how many years that is. Um, and I, I live in what I call the crucible of fear and greed. So when things are really good, everybody wants to get in, but it's probably the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And when things are really bad, the crucible's grinding. I got to get out. Everybody wants to get out. We want to get in. But within that sort of emotional framework, we live in this bubble, financial professionals. We know about uh, discounted cash flow modeling. We know about you know, buying and holding. We know about asset allocation and diversification. You get one arm's length out from our industry and the average person really thinks that speculation drives the day. Mm -hmm. So we're caught in this bubble where we think there's a process around it, we need to stick with that. And people will see you know, sound-minded investors uh, people with nice portfolios, right on track with their financial plan, will see something moving up a lot. And they will want to invest in it just for that reason alone. And then we've got, I don't want to overgeneralize, but generally people under 30 think that meme stocks like AMC and GameStop, um, crypto, and DeFi, decentralized finance, no regulation around investments, think SBF, um, is the way to go. So there's a whole generation of people who have no concept of process-based investing. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book to bring people in through the, the, the notion of great stocks, stocks that can change your life. Some of these companies that I reviewed, great stories like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, others, went up 100, 200,000 plus percent in their lifetime. So that sort of meets the speculative investor's desire to make a lot of money. And we did a review of, of how they worked and kind of built some rules around it to help investors get away from speculating with their gut mm -hmm. to process-based investing through the avenue they want to come in, which is speculation. So what can you tell us, like what kind of things did you learn and how can we spy? I mean, looking back, it's so easy. I'm gonna die, Amazon or Microsoft. I mean, of but, course, we just know? should have bought Microsoft the day it came out. I know. And retired about 20 or years Apple ago. How do we miss whatever, that? But how would we know, say these AI or whatever, the stocks are today that we would know which are going to be the winners. Yeah, great question. So I started with the the most some of the most successful stocks of the last 60 years: Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Tesla mm -hmm. as a bunch of case studies. Mm -hmm. So we did a, a kind of a fun review. Everybody kind of knows the stories, but it was really fun to kind of dig in. What was the evolution of these companies? How did they get there? The ups, the downs, the setbacks. How did they overcome it? And then what we tried to do is glean some sub, sub, sort of subjective. Um, checkpoints that made all these companies successful. And some of the things that came up, one of the most important thing that, things that came up is that leadership is extremely important sure. beyond belief. Yeah. If you look at these companies, most of these companies are run by borderline genius individuals. Mm. And by the way, uh, leaving Harvard or Stanford early never really hurts. I was going to say, not all cases. You can't say Bill Gates, um, Jeff Bezos left. Jeff Bezos, Princeton, right? Uh, Steve Jobs left his studies That's to go right. study bo That's Buddhism. Right. That's right. Um, he, he's the most fascinating of all the leaders. Yeah. But I don't want to get too deep into the into the weeds on this. Mm -hmm. But. Um, so that's important. You need to have a global worldwide market. So we can think of a company like Uber, whether it worked or it didn't, terraforming the entire transportation industry and the fractured cab industry is a global market. The PC industry going from a secular change of you know, <clears throat> doing things by hand to the PC ecosystem that built up around that entire world, that is a global marketplace. So. The problem, though, with any subjective checklist mm -hmm. is that you and I, as thoughtful pr professionals and people, could argue about who's a genius, who's not a genius. Take Elon Musk, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. Is he a genius? Half the people think he is. Half the people think he's a lightning rod. So we could argue all of these. Could be both. The point is, 
anything that's subjective is just open to having a, a cup of coffee and disagreeing on it. And I realized as I went through this, we need to take it to a different level mm -hmm. by adding an objective algorithm, okay. a scoring mechanism mm -hmm. to take our gut out of it, take our opinion out of it, um, and bring some sanity to investing and speculating and get away from our gut feelings and our subjectivity. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, because that's the thing. And it's so, again, it's just so hard to tell. Um, like, if you look at, you know, let's say gateway computer. Um, you, you mean know, back in the day? <clears throat> back in the day. Well, that, you know, seemed like... Sounded great. great. Had a great name. Right. And, and you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of people listening to this broadcast <laughs> probably don't even don't remember know. Gateway. Yes, they had the cow boxes. I remember yes. that. But, you know, you think back to those, or even like some of the early search engines and things like that, they, they seem so great. What is it that makes the winners stand out among those? That's the reason you needed an objective algorithm. If okay. we pick in the future the next 10 or 20 great stocks, we're going to pick some gateways, some Lycos search engines. Yeah. We might pick an Amazon in there. We might pick a Microsoft. But if you look at your personal history of trying to pick the next great stocks, if you pick 10, you might get one. If you pick 20, you might get two or three. Nobody's going to pick 10 out of 10. Okay. And in those cases where they turn out to be the next gateways of the world, you don't want to take the investment that you made, watch it go up, and then go to zero. So the objective algorithm that I built includes things like just basic price action, price action around earnings reports, meaning if it reacts very positively or very negatively to earnings, that's news to the market, and you need to pay attention to that. Okay. Uh, we do a, a lot of technical analysis work. So for us, technical analysis, analysis is like the um, instrument panel on an airplane in a rainstorm. It filters out all the bad inputs, your emotion, your gut, and gives you an objective reading as to whether things are good or bad or not. So by applying some of those tools like relative strength, stochastics, and some others that we use, when they start going negative, it's telling you something's wrong whether you believe it or not. So maybe instead of selling all the stock or keeping it forever because you just believe in it, mm -hmm. maybe trim it a little bit. And the more things that go negative on whatever algorithm you build, you can use ours or, or build your own, it doesn't matter. When things start going negative, start legging out of the stocks. You end up with some money on the 18 out of 20 stocks that you pick that don't work. Mm -hmm. And the ones that don't, do work, they're not going to have those negative characteristics. You're going to end up owning the majority of those positions the entire way. Now, there's nothing perfect. Mm -hmm. And if you pick the greatest stocks in the world over the last 60 years, would it make any sense to trade them ever? Of course not. No, you just hold on to them. You're not doing this mm -hmm. to maximize the return on the absolute one or two best stocks in the world that you happen to pick. You're doing this to preserve capital on the ones that inevitably won't work. Right. And I apologize to your one or two viewers who every stock they pick only goes up. But for the rest <laughs> of us, we have a couple stinkers now and then, especially yeah. when we're speculating. It's all about moving from speculating and relying on your gut mm -hmm. to, to investing with a process and preserving capital when things inevitably don't work. And for the ones that do, maintaining the majority of that position and benefiting from it for as long as possible. Yeah. I'll tell you one interesting thing. When we, we talked about Microsoft, Microsoft peaked in 1999, as you might remember. It took 17 years to mm -hmm. eclipse that high. Now, I don't know about you, but 17 weeks is a long time for the average investor that I work with. 17 months is forever. That's when you get real investor fatigue. 17 years doesn't exist. Yeah. So having a way to manage around this you know, volatility that we're always going to see in the market, we're seeing it right now, we're going to see it forever and ever, is a way to get away from gut-based investing to process-based investing. And that's why I think the book's so important. Yeah. Bring the younger generation into more process. And for our sound-minded investor friends who occasionally take a flyer, don't put 50000 in something and pretend it's going to be gone. Create some guardrails around it and a little insurance in case things don't work. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's all good advice. And I, I remember those Microsoft days. You see, Bomber was the CEO. They kind of missed out on the smartphone thing. And yeah, there was a lot of reasons. We there, go through but, all that stuff. You yeah. know, all these companies have things that don't work. And part of the process of being a great company is when something doesn't work, Get rid of it. Get and out of all it. Of Quick. These, all of yeah. these companies. Amazon do that. has had failure. They try to phone too. Tons like, and tons. Yeah. 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 We go through that in the book. It was an interesting sort of analysis. So if, if I have your book, can I learn how this algorithm works? We list the algorithm. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect algorithm, and we change and improve it all the time. The main thing is to be thinking about where those next great companies are coming from. And we do uh, a big piece in that in the book. And then as you look for those next great companies, just bring some process to it and don't let caution fly to the wind and you know, hope you end up working out well. Yeah, and, and would you suggest diversification as well? To 100%, okay. you know, we, we initially talked, 
10 great names, 20 great names. There's going to be one person viewing this broadcast that has picked one great name and it's worked forever and congratulations. But yeah. the majority of Very us hard. as yeah. regular investors have a couple of clunkers in there along the way. So you've got to diversify. Yeah. Um, okay. So how can somebody find the book, buy it? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's an Amazon bestseller, by the way. It just oh, came out on October 10th. Yeah. So we're excited about that. And we list all of the next great areas to look at. We uh, It took two years mm. of so much work to write. It was like training for a marathon. Um, and we listed AI, quantum okay. computing, I was gonna autonomous ask, driving. Like, well, what are, can you give us a Well, we listed all those types of okay. things, and it's all in the book listed out. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the book starting about two years ago. And AI hit, I don't know what day it was, but it seems like February 14th, AI was a thing. Right. And so I'd written about it in advance, but the book wouldn't be published till later. So I did a little piece about it, because AI is interesting. People are concerned that AI is a bubble, right? They talk about mm -hmm. it all the time. I don't think it is. If we look at the major secular business changes over the last 50 or 60 years, one of the first ones was when Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak showed up at the West Coast Computer Fair in 1977 with their little box mm -hmm. called the Apple II computer. Mm -hmm. And it ushered in the PC computer age and built a whole bull market around it and an ecosystem around it. You mentioned Gateway, others, Dell, so many, IBM was involved in it. Uh, we talk about it in the book. But it had certain characteristics that are common to other great secular business changes. Number one, it promised massive economic efficiencies across the entire economy. Mm. Number two, it captured the public's imagination. Mm. And I'm probably older than you, but I used to type things. Yeah. And I thought it was a great typewriter. Mm -hmm. So you, you didn't have to put that little correction thing in there and fix it. I was so thrilled. I was just starting college at UCLA. Uh -huh. uh, that really wasn't what the PC revolution was about. So the third point is not only does it capture the public's imagination, but nobody really gets what it's going to do. It takes time to evolve. In 1991 or 1992, the internet broke, as you remember. Mm -hmm. Talk about the Wild West, right? But it promised massive economic efficiencies across the economy, captured the public's imagination, but nobody really knew what it was going to do. And when you look at AI, it has those characteristics. So we think it's a serious secular business change that could carry an ecosystem around it mm -hmm. for a long time. We're seeing this week the markets beating these stocks up. That's not unusual over a 10, 15 year development period, things go up and down. Um, but it definitely captures the public. Um, the first one is it um, promises massive economic efficiencies mm -hmm, across mm -hmm. the entire economy. Look at Hollywood's on strike right now. Why are they primarily on strike? Yep. They're fighting about how to manage this AI evolution that no one's even sure how it's gonna work. Captures the public's imagination. And again, nobody knows how it's gonna evolve. So we think it's, it's a real thing, but there's going to be others, autonomous driving, quantum computing, mm -hmm. uh, satellite. We list them all in the book. Space, I think, was Space. one I saw, too. Yeah, so there's a bunch of criterion to look at as a company comes out, but those are the, we want people to kind of target in on those areas that, as they build out the next great companies for the next 20, yeah. 30, 40, 60 years and transform their portfolio. Yeah, um, well, it's fascinating. I feel like we're just on the verge of <clears throat> so many interesting developments in the world Definitely. that things are going to look a lot different in a generation or two. So, well, thank you so much, Todd, for coming in and giving us a preview of your book. Thank you, Jane. It's always a great pleasure to be here at the NASDAQ market yeah. site. So thrilling. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks.